Uh, I said facetiously that we would have a guest speaker tonight because he's he doesn't usually speak on Wednesday nights. He usually teaches a class or something else that we have. But we do have a guest speaker tonight. It makes it feel better if I say that. So Mike is going to do our our speak uh, our speak for us tonight. We have guest speakers scheduled for all summer, with except I think it's two exceptions: one with, with Mike one night and one with Marty one night. So uh, Mike, I'll turn it over to you, brother. You know, if Linda didn't want to hear this speech, no, I pray she'll be okay. I don't know if you know that she, uh, she suffers from asthma and uh, that causes her to lose consciousness from time to time. I was actually surprised for her being here tonight, it being so warm out, so on and so forth. So I think I see them getting her in the car, so I think she'll be okay. All right, our Wednesday night series. I'm your guest speaker for this Wednesday night. The theme, of course, as you know, is uh, what the church needs to hear. What the church needs to hear. There's a guy that wrote a book, a minister wrote a book, and he said his book had a title like that, What My Church Needs to Hear, But I Need My Job. <laughs> it's a very interesting book. I want to start with uh, witness. Whoop, I'm, uh, I'd like to get the PowerPoint up, though. Is it up now? We're good. OK, so I'd like to start with a, a witness. We don't do that a lot in the church, you know, a witness. I want to do a witness. I want to give my witness. Because I think the church needs to hear my witness as an individual. I grew up in French Quebec in the 50s as a Roman Catholic, <clears throat> and I obeyed the gospel when I was 30 years old. Now you have to understand that the uh, Catholic Quebec in the 50s and 60s was a place where 90% of the people shared a homogeneous faith. In other words, it was the only religion in town. Six million people in that province, and more than 90% of them were Catholic. So wherever you went, the religion was the same. Every town, every little city, every church, every service was exactly the same, all Catholic. The mayor was Catholic, the, the premier was Catholic, all the politicians were Catholic, the, the, the police chief was Catholic. In Montreal in 1950, you could not get a license to have a public meeting that was not Catholic based. If you were a Protestant and you wanted to come in or evangelical and you want to have a public meeting somewhere and you need a license to do it, you couldn't do it. You couldn't get it. That's, that's, where, that's what I come from. There were three key figures in the church around whom our interest and our devotion centered. First was Christ himself and he was always portrayed as a child in the manger at Christmas or as a corpse on the cross at Easter. There was no in-between. He was either a little baby or he was dead. The second main person in our liturgy, if you wish, was Mary, the mother of Jesus, who governed our emotional attraction. When I was young, I was taught to pray to Mary so that she could talk to Jesus, so that he could talk to God. And I can still remember as a little kid being at church, kneeling in front of a statue of Mary and asking her for things, whatever. And then there was the Pope, who was the leader and the hero of the church. He was the chief teacher and interpreter of morals and religious ideas. What he said, that, that was law, that there was no arguing with the Pope. Now my spiritual journey away from Catholicism took me through several ideological marking points. And most of these insights that I had revolved around the nature of the church and it's how it's put together. And so every major insight that I had, spiritual insight, had to do with the church. 
And so this lesson is a witness of my own spiritual journey in search of the cross-centered church. I was looking for that church. And so the first insight that I had was the one that led me away from the religion of my youth. And here's the insight. The church comes from the Bible. The Bible doesn't come from the church. You might think that's kind of silly, you know, growing up in the Church of Christ or growing up in the Bible Belt, you know, but for me that was like an aha moment. I mean, growing up as a Roman Catholic conditioned me to believe that the Bible was a product of the Roman Catholic Church. Since only the priests worked with it, and only the pope understood it, and only the church leaders used it in liturgy or ceremony, well, it must have been the invention of the church. Ironically enough, it was a Pentecostal group called the Cleansing Church of Christ that first introduced me to the notion contained in 2 Timothy 3.16, you know, where Paul says, every scripture is inspired by God. Now, we say that all the time, we just roll that one, every scripture is inspired by God, 2 Timothy 3.16, everybody knows that. But for me, I grew up, every scripture is inspired by the church. So this was like, wow. For most, that scripture argues for the divine inspiration of the Bible. But for me, however, this passage opened the door to religious exploration. For me, this scripture said, that the church is a creation of the Bible and not vice versa. God is the one who inspired the Bible, not the church. For me, this was a mandate to examine every church according to the Bible, even the Roman Catholic one, and when I did, it was found wanting. And so I left. The next insight was more complex and it took longer to come into view. It was the answer to the question, why am I a member of the Church of Christ? Now, I knew why I was a member of the body of Christ, but was my association with the Church of Christ the same thing? I, I had to work that out in my adult mind. Many of you who grew up in the church probably never even asked yourself that question. You see, I was baptized in a very small congregation in Montreal after having studied with the local preacher. I mean, I was a typical 30-year-old who had messed up his life and finally turned to God for help and found salvation. No new story there. And the first few years of my Christian walk centered on questions of personal holiness, you know, giving up smoking, giving up immoral behavior, you know, the things that, the baby steps of Christianity. And discipleship, coming to church, learning how to serve, you know, the basic things. Training how to teach a class and then later how to preach. But then when I left Montreal and I began to travel around, I became aware of Christianity in a much larger context than just the little church that I went to in Montreal. And this question really started to bother me as I drove through Dallas and I drove through Houston and I drove through you know, it's towns in, the, in Tennessee and Oklahoma City and there was the Church of the Nazarene and there was the Choctaw Church and there was the Baptist Church and there was the Methodist Church. I had never seen that. You have to understand, I'd never seen that. All I saw was the Catholic Church and then the Church of Christ. So I thought, well, isn't everybody a member of the Church of Christ? And to my surprise, I found out, no. The statement that the Church of Christ is the only true church, is the only church following the Bible, are the only ones who want to be disciples, might be sincere statements. And they may be true statements, but I realized that we were not the only ones making those statements. You see what I'm saying? 
Other people promoted the idea that their church was based on the Bible too. And they were Bible churches. So where did that leave me? Well, it left me with two options. Number one, I could conclude that everybody else was a liar. Or everyone else is mistaken. Or everyone else is insincere. That could be one conclusion. The problem with that is I couldn't make that judgment because I can't read the heart of every single individual and I'm not supposed to. Another conclusion I could have come to is, well, maybe there exists a great variety of expressions of the body of Christ or the church, many different churches, and they just don't know each other, but God knows who they are. And that was a very comforting thought to me for a time. You know, the idea of ecumenism, we call it ecumenism, or uh, the, the term ecumenic means universal, all roads lead to God type thing. Very comforting, very comforting. The idea of ecumenism is based on this position and it strives to introduce everybody to everybody else in Christianity. Let's all just be friends. Let's just all be one big happy family. The problem with this conclusion, again, this is my witness. I'm telling you my spiritual journey. The problem with this conclusion, let's everybody be friends, it doesn't matter, doctrine's not important. There was a problem I had with that. Two problems, actually. First of all, this idea does not match the figurative language used to describe the church as a body in Ephesians 4, 15 and 16. And I want to read that for you, Ephesians 4, 15 and 16. Paul says, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by, what, uh, by that which every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Well, wait a minute now. Whoa. Let's all get together. Everybody's part of the big same happy family. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that the body knows itself. The body supports itself. The body corrects itself. The body nurtures itself. This business of ecumenism where there are many bodies and they don't know each other does not match this description in the Bible. And you have to understand the reason I left the Catholic Church is that I could find so many things that it did that did not match the Bible. And so the same rule you know, persisted as I questioned this idea of, you know, why am I a member of this church? Why am I not a member of that church? And then there was another problem with the issue of ecumenism or universal, uh, universality. This position does not allow me to work towards the unity prayed for by Christ in John 17, 11, where Jesus says, Holy Father, keep them in my name, which thou hast given me that they may be, that they may be one, even as we are one. So if separate bodies are okay, then why does Jesus pray that we all be just one body? And so I realized that ecumenism was not the answer to my question. I didn't have the answer to my question, but I knew that ecumenism was not the answer to my question. Upon further study, I realized that the reason I am a member of the Church of Christ and not continuing my search elsewhere is because of the idea of restoration. The idea of restoration that is at work in the church. I began to understand that the uniqueness of our movement was based not on the fact that we said that we were a Bible-based movement, because a lot of people do that, but rather our serious commitment to restoring the church according to the Bible. That's what makes us unique. People always say to me, you know, 
well, what's the difference between you guys and those guys over there, and you guys and those guys over there, and you guys and those guys up over there, and you guys and the... And, was, and I hear people go into this big, long, you know, theological explanation, which may be true, but is complex. But if you want to squeeze it down into a soundbite, the difference is we are trying to restore the church according to the New Testament in our age. That's what makes us different from them and them and those people over there. So this objective, this key idea, I began to see works like a gyro compass. You know what a gyro compass is, right? Gyro compass is a compass that always points to true north no matter what position you are in. There's a gyro compass in a plane because if you're upside down or whatever, the compass is always pointing to north or on a ship. Well, I saw that this restoration principle not only guides us towards a faithful life in Christ and ultimate salvation, but also is the spiritual mechanism that can produce the unity that the New Testament says that we must have. Restorationism is our spiritual gyro compass. It always points to true north. You know, a lot of churches throughout history have begun with the good intention of being Bible-based. You know, Martin Luther, when he started, well, what did he say? Only Scripture. I mean, Martin Luther said, let's get back to Scripture. He had the right idea. The problem is, a lot of these churches throughout history who have begun with the good intention of being Bible-based but without the gyro compass of the restoration idea, when they begin to wander away from the truth, the one truth of Ephesians chapter four, for example, there is nothing in their theological system to bring them back. So they start off with a good idea, but the moment that there's false doctrine, the moment that there's division, the moment they start drifting in the way, there's nothing inherently in their thinking that brings them back to the center. There's no compass. The principle of restorationism is not a human idea that's imposed on the Bible. It's a Bible idea revealed as far back as Genesis where the cycle of falling away and being restored began and was complete or repeatedly rather demonstrated throughout the Old Testament period in the history of the Jews. It is also reinforced in the New Testament when Jesus admonishes the apostles to teach the disciples to obey all that he taught, Matthew 28. And the apostles were continually urging the church to either maintain the standard in Jude 3 or return to it in Galatians 1. Listen, in Jude 3, when Jude says that we are to contend earnestly for the faith once delivered to the saints, who do you think he was talking to? Do you think he was talking to us? Well, yeah, but at, in that day and time, who was he talking to? He was talking to the church. And why did he say this? Because the church was in danger of moving away from the things that the apostles had taught. And he was exhorting them to be restored to the teaching. Some people say, well, the Church of Christ, you guys invented restoration. We didn't invent restorationism. We simply recognized it as a biblical principle and we applied it to our Christian lives. What do you think Paul said when he said in Galatians, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you uh, by the grace of Christ for another gospel. What were they doing those Galatians? They were moving away from the original teachings, the original gospel. What was Paul trying to do? He was trying to restore them back. The point of all this is to say the following. Restoration and restorationism is necessary as a biblical principle. Believe it or not, it's as necessary as baptism. Many churches are based on various biblical principles and are sincerely trying to follow Jesus, but only the Church of Christ has rediscovered and implemented the restoration principle 
in order to actually become a New Testament church. In the, you know, it's, it's popular to, to, to you know, knock the church. I read you know, magazines and I read in the Chronicle. And I, there's always somebody that's knocking the church. We're not doing this enough. We're not doing that enough. We're hypocrites. We're this and that. Well, I want to tell you something. In the modern era, we are the most successful restoration churches. There may be others out there doing, trying this, but no one has succeeded at it as we have. No one has a body of literature about it like we have. No one has as many congregations devoted to this idea as we have. Tens and tens of thousands of congregations. And so even if there are heretics and hypocrites in the church of Christ, I remain. Because the church consciously tries to obey all of what Jesus commands. And because of this mechanism of restorationism, the church is able to avoid the complete apostasy that other groups have fallen victim to because they did not follow this biblical principle. Some people say, oh, there's division in the church of Christ. Yes, there are three or four or five you know, major groups. You know. Have you ever thought of how many groups there are in the Baptist fellowship? Hundreds. Hundreds and hundreds. Why? Because every, every time somebody has a new idea about something, they form a new church based on that idea. There's no one among their group that says, we need to go back to the Bible. We need to go back to restoring the New Testament church as it is described in the New Testament. That's what makes us unique. Not the fact that we have communion, not the fact that we even baptize in water. Other people do that too. And not only do I remain, but I encourage my children to follow as well because I know that because we espouse these principles, their souls and their children's souls will be saved. Because in every age in the church of Christ, if we go right too much or left too much, there'll always be somebody standing up and saying, wait a minute, let's get back to the basics. And no eldership will fault that person, that preacher, that whoever it is. Because we're committed to the idea of establishing New Testament churches in our age, in our era. A third insight completed my education. The third insight was that restoring the cross to the center of church life is extremely important. This understanding about restorationism led me to this insight and the one that is directly related to the substance of my lesson. I realized that the main objective of restorationism is to continually restore the cross of Jesus Christ as the central point in the life of the church. I've come to understand that just discovering the mechanism of restoration as a biblical principle does not guarantee the restoration of the New Testament church any more than discovering the principle of electricity guarantees light. You've got to learn how to apply the principle in order to produce the effect. The proper application of the restoration mechanism is in making sure that the cross of Jesus remains at the center of the life of the church. In doing so, the church will remain true to the New Testament and thus perpetuate itself in every culture and every age. Listen to what I'm saying now. What we've concentrated on, to our disadvantage, is to only restore New Testament forms to worship and baptism. You know, we need to worship without instrument. Well, that's a biblical way to worship, of course. And that baptism is by immersion in the water. Yes, of course, that's a biblical form. But we've put so much emphasis on those ideas, we've neglected the core of the gospel. And the core of the gospel is the cross of Jesus is at the center of my life and is at the center of our communal life. That's restoring New Testament Christianity. The question that arises from this conclusion was the most difficult. How do you restore the cross to the center? I believe that the Bible teaches us this in the following ways. A couple of more points. Lesson will be yours. 
Restoring the cross to the center, the true work of restoration. We thought, we thought that the true work of restorationism was making sure everybody was baptized in the water by immersion. But the true work of restorationism, without forgetting that, is to make sure that the cross of Christ is the center of my life and the center of your life and your life. How do we do it? Number one, restore cross-centered preaching. Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it is the power of God unto salvation. If the cross is to be at the center of the church, then the cross must be at the center of the preaching of the church. An example of this type of preaching is Peter's first sermon in Acts 2 where he proclaims Christ as divine Messiah. He talks about his death and burial and resurrection as a fact and repentance and baptism as the only response to the offer of forgiveness from God. Who cares that baptism is in the water? I mean, who cares? You think the people out there care about that? Really? People out there, single moms with four or five kids, abusive husbands, you think people on drugs, you think, <laughs> You think people with all kinds of financial issues haven't, been, haven't worked for a year, been thrown out of their house, you think, and those people without God, you think those people really care that we don't use an instrument during our worship? You think they really care about that? No, they don't care about that. Why? Because that's not the gospel. The gospel is about the cross. That's what people care about. That's what draws them. And thankfully, because we're a restorationist church, when they say, what must I do? OK. We got the answer for you right from the book. Acts 2.38, repent, be baptized, forgiveness of your sins, receive the Holy Spirit. But we can't say, we can't tell them what the response is until we tell them what the gospel is, because that's where the good news is at. So this message needs to be proclaimed over and over again using every method of communication at our disposal. This is the message that the masses need to hear in order to be saved. It's the one we need to make in order to lay claim to the name Church of Christ. We invest our energy and millions of dollars in building auditoriums so we can preach this message to the saved. But let me ask you this. Would we ever dream of spending a million bucks to preach this message to the lost? Would we as a church ever borrow money so that we could preach to a million people or 10 million people? Would we do that? And we wonder why the church doesn't grow. And why do we spend to preach to foreign countries but we don't do it here in our own town? You know, it's becoming popular to substitute this message with one based on the history of the church or the Bible as a self-help book, remedies for social ills taken from psychologists. But the power of God unto salvation is the gospel and the power of the gospel is the cross and that's what our evangelism efforts should be about, telling people about the cross. Without cross-centered preaching to the lost, we lose sight of the shoreline and we quickly become discouraged and discontent and dishonest. True restorationism also requires that we restore cross-centered teaching. Acts 2.42. You know, once people are brought to salvation through cross-centered preaching, they need to be grounded by being taught a cross-centered faith. A good example of this is Philip and the eunuch in Acts 8, 34 and 5. What was Philip teaching the eunuch? He was teaching him what the prophets had to do with the cross of Christ, how these two things were related. And a lot of times we teach a lot of things. We teach about issues. We teach about individual offense and people in the Bible. We get a lot of facts about the Bible. We teach about how to use the Bible as a self-help device to feel better. But in order to restore the cross to the center, we need to restore the New Testament church. We need to make sure that the church is being taught how all of these parts of the Bible fit into the cross. I never get tired of preaching about the cross of Jesus. I never get tired of explaining how whatever is in the Bible fits into that plan. 
Why do you think we spent 23 sessions in great Christian doctrine? And what was it all about? It was all about the cross. 23 solid weeks of teaching just about the cross. And I could have kept going. You know, the teaching of the Bible is like a wheel with spokes. And all the spokes are all the individual teaching. And at the center is the cross of Jesus. All the teaching emanates from it and goes to it. Everything looks to or emanates from the cross of Christ and without this conscious awareness and purpose teaching, the church drifts away from the center. I ask you to review the book of Acts and the epistles and see if this is not the overall objective of Peter and Paul in their sermons and writings. I think Raymond Kelsey, great Greek scholar and Bible teacher of bygone years, had this in mind when he wrote his book, Christ-Centered Sermons. You see, the cross is at the center and the New Testament church is around it. And in order to maintain this position, we must demonstrate and teach repeatedly how all things relate to the cross. And then finally, true restorationism requires that we restore cross-centered living. Romans chapter 8, verse 13 says the following. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Pretty simple, isn't it? Preachers preach the cross, teachers teach the cross, and we as the church must live the cross for the restoration of New Testament Christianity to be complete. Publicly, we live it through baptism and communion. Those are the outward expressions of cross-centered lives. But privately, we live it by dealing with sin on a day-to-day -day basis. Someone says, well, how, you know, that's pretty, you know, that's a kind of a theological, that's way up there idea. You know, how do I live a cross-centered life? You know, how do I do that? You know, it sounds good in a sermon, as a point in a sermon. How do I do that? You deal with your sins. That's how you do it. Whether you're young or old, you deal with your sinfulness every day. That's cross-centered living. We can be known by others as the New Testament church by our preaching and our teaching and the sign on the door. And others witness that we are focused on the New Testament by the way we baptize, by the way we worship, by the way we organize ourselves for work. We can look like the cross-centered New Testament church in front of the world, but unless we enter the arena and we struggle with the lust of our eyes and flesh and, the, and battle the pride of our lives, God will not know us as the cross-centered church. I'm going to go to Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Read that. I think it's up there on the, the PowerPoint. Verse 21 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Listen, listen. If God refuses to recognize those who do miracles without holy living, do you think that he will recognize us only because we figured out the proper mode of baptism and done away with instruments of music, but we have not dealt with the sin in our lives? Really? You think that that'll cut it? In the end, man will not decide who is the true church, although we sure spent a whole lot of time debating it. God will decide which is the true church of Christ, who has managed to restore it in each generation. I'm saying to you, we've been so blessed because of the people who have come before us. They've left us a body of understanding and knowledge to help us do that by implementing this idea of the restorationist ideal. When he comes, when he comes, he will not be fooled by the crosses on buildings. 
He will not be fooled by people wearing crosses as jewelry. He will come for those who have hung themselves on the cross with his son, Jesus Christ. This is what cross-centered living is all about. Paul says it in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 11. He says, it is a trustworthy statement, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. You think he means if we die, like if we die, my heart stops and I die? You think that's the reason that I'll reign with him? No, 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 no. If we're prepared to die to sin each day, okay, okay. And if we endure, endure what? Endure the problems of life? Endure the injustices in, of life? Endure the illnesses of life, endure old age, endure sickness, endure job loss, endure whatever, the unfairness of it all, if we endure that without losing faith. If we do that, he says, then we'll reign with him. He doesn't have to state it in a negative form. It's understood. But if you don't do that, then you're not worthy to reign. We're not worthy to reign. So my exhortation to you is biblical, and it's simple, and it's familiar. Let's continue to restore the New Testament church by keeping the cross at the center of our spiritual experience. Keep cross-centered preaching as our main message to the world. Promote cross-centered teaching to build true New Testament churches. And perseverance in cross-centered living that we might be found faithful when he comes and he comes at any time. And I, I hate to use our dear sister Linda, we know she's okay, she, she went out, but that's exactly how it happens. You're there, you're alive, you're doing okay, and then all of a sudden you're not. In my experience as a minister dealing with people who have died I have not yet one time found someone who was actually ready for the moment that it came. And I mean ready, like, I don't mean ready in faith wise. I mean, they're very ill, they're terminal, they know they're going to die, they're in the hospital, they're all hooked up, but it still comes as a surprise when they actually die. Oh, I thought I had another few minutes at least. <laughs> That's the thought. Last night we were driving. My wife and I, and we had the baby with us. We had uh, Emily's baby with us, uh, Emily House baby in the back seat. We went to Homeland, uh, Home Depot to get something. No big deal, right? We get the thing, we put it in the car, we're going to put up a blind in one of the rooms, you know. We're, we're having fun, the baby's in a good mood, we're fine, isn't it wonderful? Life is good, we, we, we're pulling out of the, we're just pulling out of there, and just pulling out of there, thankfully, Lise was driving, she, she's a cautious driver. She just was ready to slow down, and out of the alley, came two guys in a truck, zooming right by us, no stop, didn't even see us. We could have been saying, hey, you know, Lily, how you doing? You know, and Mama could have been looking in the rear view, looking at the baby, and these guys would have just walloped us, killed us. Were we ready? Well, spiritually, I hope we were, but ready, you know what I'm saying? Today I'm going to die? No. Because all we were doing was going to Home Depot. And let's also continue to uphold the restoration principle as a key element in our teaching and not neglect to pass it on intact to the next generation. I don't want us to be remembered in history as the ones who failed to stand firm in this area when we came under attack. Those kids that are out there and those kids that we're going to have here in VBS and that, those teens that go to camp, somewhere along the line, we're going to have to pass on to them the gyro compass so that they too will be able to find true north when we're gone. This is our watch. This is us. We're on watch now. Let's make sure that the perimeter is secure when the guard will change. I thank you very much for your attention. I pray that God bless you as we all pursue together cross-centered living. Amen. Amen. Thank you.